up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the eight-game main slate here on Wednesday, uh, May 3. Uh, try and keep this one a little bit short. I know I say this every day. Sorry that we get get long um, in these in these videos a little bit. So feel free to you know, watch them on uh, 6x speed or, or whatever. Um, try and keep this one a little bit condensed, though, today. We've got some arms on the mound we can get to, I think. Uh, interesting tournament slate. Once again, Bieber. We have Stroman. Uh, we have Dylan Cease at an elevated price tag. Back up above 10,000 is Cease. We have Otani down here at 11.4. He gets a Cardinals. Probably not the greatest matchup you want to be paying 11.4 for a guy. Um, and we have Coors Field. So I think we're going to have to kind of mix things up here and... I kind of left out Logan Gilbert here. Um, he's coming in the chalkiest as of right now. Um, so we have Coors Field. Once again, the Brewers were not impressive last night. Um, really, nor were the Rockies. Uh, Freddie Peralta really kind of was. So um, you're going to have to play the ownership game again. And here in early runs, uh, Milwaukee is coming in at uh, about twice the ownership of every other team on the on the slate. So... Um, pretty natural here, and and we'll see. They've been awful against lefties. Uh, unfortunately, the Coors Field elephant in the baseball room uh, kind of forces us to get to a lot of the Brewers a lot of the time. Certainly in cash, we're going to want to attack that. Uh, in tournaments, though, I think we can, just as we did yesterday, get to some other spots where we might want to... Um, try and search for some value. And I think there's some attackable arms here. Uh, we got a young kid making his debut for Washington. Um, probably not the, not near the prospect upside that uh, Mason and Bryce Miller offer. Um, really underwhelming numbers throughout his career in the minors here. So I think we might be able to get to some Cubs, for example. Um we have Louis Varland on the mound, who's an interesting piece here. He's at a playable price tag. Uh, he gets the hapless White Sox. Um, we'll get into these numbers and, and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to have to make some decisions once again, just weighing the Brewers' ownership here and try to get to some equitable spots in some of these other games to balance our Milwaukee exposure that we're we're want to have right uh and of course we want to get to some of these arms as well so that said let's get into it uh we do have projections and initial ownerships loaded to the site um but usual early day disclaimers keep an eye on these numbers because they will change we saw yesterday that ownership numbers steamed pretty hard going into lock on the cheap guys mason and bryce miller uh they were projecting anywhere from 17 20 percent or so and they ended up coming in way higher than that in a lot of stuff so um turns out that it was warranted right you needed those guys to win team or win tournaments um but they allowed you to get to the various arms up at the top that you really wanted to play now today is a little bit different of course in that we've got um you know call it four guys up here five if you want to include gilbert up above in the in the top end of the the pricing spectrum and Shohei at 11 4 he's got a difficult matchup against the Cardinals Dylan Cease against the Twins also kind of a sneaky difficult matchup uh and he has a walk problem Bieber gets probably the best matchup with the Yankees missing Judge and everybody else in their clubhouse um Stroman Maybe he gets the best matchup. Who knows? Not in terms of raw strikeout stuff, of course, but uh, Washington is a pretty low upside in general. Of course, Gilbert does get Oakland, right? That's why we're seeing him come in with such high ownership. So the ownerships on these guys compared to yesterday, probably going to stay mostly flat because we don't have anybody down here in the in the cheap range. Like the, the ownership on J.P. Sears is not going to steam to 20% or anything like that. Um you know, you're not going to see, as, as people do research on Jake Irvin, as they did yesterday, ownership number steam north of 15%, because every number is going to tell you to stay away from this dude. So um, probably going to stay mostly flat. But once again, just keep an eye out. 
these things will change throughout the day as they do normally. Projections change as well, and that is going to ultimately dictate lineup construction going into lock. So, uh, spiel aside, let's uh, let's just get into the games here, and we'll try and keep this one a little bit short. I know we uh, went really long yesterday, so we'll try and uh, condense things a little bit here. Bieber up at the top for Cleveland, uh, 9,500 against the Yankees. Uh, we've been targeting the Yankees all season, and we did it once again yesterday with some Tanner Bybee. Um, he was pretty good. And until about the sixth inning where he kind of ran out of gas, took a line drive off his off his left wrist, I believe, um, gave up a homer after that and, and then a double, I think. And he ended up getting hung with about two runs, but uh, he was overall really good uh, against the Yankees. And I think we can you know, certainly target Bieber, uh, far more experienced, but going to throw strikes as we know Bieber – is want to do here he's coming in about 27 percent right now um this seems fine getting him in you know a quarter of our teams up at this price tag there's you know of course we're going to want to consider getting to an otani and a cease or something like that in okay matchups for them i mean but i wouldn't say plus matchups certainly but uh they're plus arms in in matchups <laughs> i suppose um Bieber is a plus arm and a plus matchup here because the Yankees still against righties, 23, 24% K rate, 90 WRC plus 163 I. So this is going to drop with the lack of every one of their power hitters out of the lineup outside of Glaber. Um, so we're, so will the hard contact, but basically just average and they're striking out a good bit. Now they've been making a little bit more contact the last couple of days, but um, I think we can still get to some Bieber here. Now, most of the time, we want to target pretty left-handed heavy lineups uh, against Bieber. Um, or we want to target left-handed lineups with Bieber, rather, because he's a little bit better suppression-wise against lefties. Not that he's bad against righties or anything. It's just the, the raw K stuff is quite a bit better, about five and a half ticks or so better to the left side than the right side. So um, more ground balls. Still hard contact to to the left side because he'll float this slider a little bit and uh, sometimes it doesn't just bite back down underneath the hands uh, like he really wants it to against lefties. And it'll kind of sit over the middle of the plate sometimes. But overall, um, plus Arsenal here for Bieber and price tag I think is very playable at 9500 Uh Pushing 18 points here in the in the early projection number, I think that's fine. We do have to keep in mind with Beaver that his last several starts, the strikeout stuff has not been there. Um, even despite a pretty good matchup against a very lefty-heavy lineup against in Boston in his last start. Now, Boston's been very good against righties in general, so don't get me wrong here. But um, we did mention in, in Beaver's last start that it could have been a, a plus spot for him. And he did go seven innings. Just struck out four, however. So um, against Yankees here, I think you could probably see the right-handed strikeout numbers pop a little bit. Uh, they're whiffing a little bit more, of course. And really the only lefty that we've got to be uh, pretty concerned with here um, is Anthony Rizzo. Of course, you know Willie Calhoun has some pop, and he's playing at Yankee Stadium as a lefty. Um and Ozzy Cabrera, he'll hit from both sides. Aaron Hicks is a shell of his old self. Um, so not too many lefties that we're overly worried about outside of Rizzo. Um, righties here, they might be able to make a little bit of contact. Certainly DJ is a contact hitter. They did get Harrison Bader back last night. Um, and Glaber Torres, he's been really, really good this year. So overall, I think the, play, the price tag is playable at 95 for Bieber and I'll, I'll certainly be getting uh, my fair share. We'll have to wait to, to see how lineup construction shakes out, but uh, I think this is a very playable spot uh, against the Yankees. Clark Schmidt on the other side, I don't think this is a playable spot. He has huge problems with lefties, and they're getting worse, as a matter of fact. Um, in the early going here this season, uh, they, these lefty numbers are just not coming down. We have a lot of bullpen numbers for him. Uh, from last season, but since he's been in the rotation and going, 
I mean, he's not really serving as a as an opener necessarily. He's gone uh, five innings in each of his last two starts, so he's stretched out. But really just the, the one-plus performance from him came against a very righty-heavy lineup in Toronto where he went five and two-thirds, struck out eight. And that's where these righty numbers down here with a plus slider, plus curveball mix uh, really came into play. 26% K rate against the righties. However, against lefties, that drops to about league average, 23%. But the contact numbers skyrocket. 320 average, 411 Woba, 266 ISO to the left side with a 2.2 homers per nine, 36% hard contact. So no soft contact induced to the left side. That's because of a lack of a changeup and a really poor fastball arsenal here throwing it a full 40 what is that 42 percent of the time give or take um and no value whatsoever so this is going to put him into a lot of really difficult spots against left-handers and we know that cleveland can get pretty left-handed heavy not wild about a 4900 nine hundred dollar price tag for stephen kwan up top but you can play josie ramirez of course 56 i like this this is a fine pl- playable price for josie uh, Josh Naylor at 39, that's playable as well. Josh Bell down at 3,300, I think that's fine. And you don't really sacrifice, um, I mean, since he's a switch hitter, you don't really sacrifice the platoon advantage with him deeper into a ball game. And we generally don't like going after the Yankee bullpen because it's been historically pretty good, but they're using, like Clark Schmidt came out of the bullpen last year, for example, and... Uh, Well, he's not available, (laughs) right, anymore. Um, So there are some arms they've had to force into the rotation that really, to this point, they've only had one good bullpen arm. Um, And we really want to target some, um, some high upside lefties here. Even though, in general, of course, we know that that Cleveland just stinks. They don't hit for any power collectively as a team. 82 WRC+. Uh, We still want to target some high upside lefties in a very high upside spot for them. Uh, 266 ISO is a huge number with 36% hard and 2.2 homers per nine at Yankee Stadium. So I think today, once again, we can consider getting to some Guardians. Um, it's just a throw up play as it is always, because they're almost certainly going to disappoint you, but, uh, you kind of have to have some of them in a, uh, so no Clark Schmidt on the mound and probably no Yankees here. I, I'm not crazy about the price tags, uh, against Bieber. Um, and I think the, the price tag on Bieber is, is okay here. And I think he's a, at a playable number. Okay. Cubs and Washington. Let's try and get through, I, I all of this pretty quickly. We can get through Jake Irvin pretty quickly. You're not going to be playing him today, even at 4,000. Like, yeah, sure, he's 4,000, um, but we're, I'm not going to go after the Cubs with him. He projects for a, about an 18% K rate at the major league level. Uh, his It's taken him several years to get up through the minors. Um, spent a couple years. It, it more of a typical route for a pitcher, uh, not the Mason Miller type of stuff where you throw nine innings in it at the minor league level and you're all of a sudden no hitting big league lineups um but jake irvin has spent about five more years uh in the minors and the stuff is really not all that uh overwhelming here um you know velocity is nothing to write home about and ultimately not going to be a target for us on the mound today. We can get to some Cubs for sure, and this is one of those spots where I think targeting a a young arm could prove pretty fruitful for us. If we want to play some Stroman on on the mound for the Cubs as well and play some correlated teams, I think that's a fine construction. 9100 this is a good price for Stroman. Now, the price is climbing a little bit compared to uh, early season outings for Stro. And the strikeout stuff, as we've talked about for Stroman in, in the last um, several outings for him, is that it's actually starting to drop off. Now, we talked at the beginning of the year, the strikeout stuff, going back to last year, had been pretty impressive at north of a K in inning. And historically, Stroman has not been that guy. But strikeout stuff coming into the season had been good. It has been tailing off a little bit in his last three starts. Still 
still going a full six innings. Um, he had one where he went five against the Dodgers. He still struck out five there, though. Uh, but the strikeout stuff tailing off in his last three outings, he got Oakland, the Dodgers, and Miami five, five, and three strikeouts in the six, five, and six and a third innings. So perhaps tailing off a little bit. And as I mentioned, the, the price tag creeping up. We are buying him at seasonal highs here at 9,100. This is Washington, however, and this team very similar to Cleveland. Um, at least in terms of power, is worse than Cleveland. You know, about two ticks worse. And in terms of production, about 11 ticks worse. They are not going to strike out as well, so kind of difficult to want to go after a historically low strikeout pitcher. And a guy in aggregate over the last season plus, 21.5% K rate, 23% to lefties, so that's fine. Nats is, the Nats are going to platoon a little bit against him. Luis Garcia, Cabert Ruiz, Jamer hit from the left side, Dom Smith, C.J. Abrams. So they can throw a solid five lefties in here. And that might make it uh, a little bit plus for Stroman. But uh, once again, in aggregate, the strikeout rate for the Nats, really to uh, both righties and lefties, is surprisingly low. 19% against righties and... Uh, I believe it was 15% against lefties. So um, even if Stroman is, is able to you know, run deep into a game, the strikeout upside is probably not going to be there. So we're mostly counting on a suppression outing from Stro. And at 9,100, I think this is fine. Early projection popping it at 17 and, and lower ownership. So I think this is a, a playable price. If you can't quite get to Beaver, uh, I think this is certainly acceptable and at lower ownership i like playing this we'll have to keep an eye on stroman's ownership as it um changes throughout the day so he may be one of these guys who does steam a little bit but he's probably going to hover in this 15 percent range just because it's stroman doesn't generally have a lot of strikeout upside but he can go a full seven innings and even if he only strikes out five or six here uh i think that's still a very playable price tag and it'll allow us to get a little bit contrarian on the mound, um, still attack with some upside, because he's still got the good sinker and good slider combination. Everything else you know, leaves a little bit on the table, surely. But um, he stays so far down in the strike zone that uh, the Nats as a whole, they're hitting one and a half ground balls per fly ball as a team. So you know, we're not terribly worried about baseballs in the air or anything and and raw production against stroman so i think it's a fine suppression spot and we can get to him at some lower ownership uh once again not playing jake irvin on the mound um we'll see how he debuts but uh because there's variance with young arms he could come up and and just dazzle everybody but um the all, all of the numbers in the in the minor leagues suggest otherwise and he does not project to to have anything north of a, a 20% aggregate K rate in the majors. So um, just the Cubs here, I think we can get to some Cub stacks definitely. And they kind of disappointed a little bit yesterday. But uh, we kind of talked about that. It was just kind of a meh spot. Um, and however, today I think we can probably add in a few more Cub stacks. Probably going to come in you know, maybe as one of the top five or six stacks that you'll be able to get to. Uh, Cody Bellinger still at a playable 4,300 here. Ian Happ down to 45, like this a lot. And Dansby is at 48. Kind of a, an expensive price tag for him in general, but um, his main weakness, certainly against righties, is strikeouts. And that's going to drop a little bit here against Irvin. So um, I think we can get to the top five. Say Suzuki at 46, very playable price. Patty Wisdom's been excellent. He is... I, either leading the league or tied for the league lead in homers this year at 45. Um, I think we can consider getting to some wisdom, certainly in stacks. With dual eligibility, it makes it a little bit more palatable to play him as a one-off. And if you need to get really cheap with it, um, because if you're playing a Nico at 53 at the top, plus a Dansby and a Suzuki and a wisdom or something, Eric Hosmer could serve as a cheap first base play for you he's at 2200 so uh very playable stack here and i think you can make this work with a lot of different arms on the mound and different constructions okay let's move on to minnesota and the white Sox. we have louis varlin talked about louis um not generally thrilled usually about playing louis 
It is an intriguing price tag, though, against uh, against the White Sox. Now, they've been a little bit better over the last couple of games. Um, the Joe Ryan took them apart yesterday, as was kind of expected. Joe Ryan is excellent. Eh, Louis Varlin, perhaps not so much. Doesn't have near the four-seamer equity that Joe Ryan does, and this might get Louis into, pr into trouble here. Um, so we might be able to get to a little bit of the White Sox in general, the short sample here on, on Louis, um, just make a few spot starts mostly over the last year plus for the Twins. And pretty much doing the same thing today because Kenta Maeda is out, Tyler Molly is out, um, the everybody in baseball is out. I, like, I don't even know where we're playing the games anymore. May as well just put everybody on the DL. 22% um, aggregate K rate for Louis. It's better against the lefties here in the early going fine changeup that he's throwing a lot, but if the four-seamer's bad, changeup's going to be bad. You hear me say this all the time, and at neutral value for the change itself, if the four-seamer is bad on that particular day, which is more probable because it's a less valuable pitch relative to league average, which increases the variance on any given outing that you see with the four-seamer, and on those days, if the four-seamer is bad, the changeup is much more likely to be bad itself. So a full 10-mile-an-hour velo delta on the on the change to the four-seamer is good, and that's really what we want to see, and it's actually what keeps this value from being markedly worse and much more in line with the negative four-seamer value. So um, to this point, has been able to suppress lefties a little bit, um, but still an 080 ground ball to fly ball here and not inducing enough soft contact. That's what, you know, due to the lack of a really good change and a good four seamer here. Uh, the four seamer really keep, or the, excuse me, the slider keeps him alive. Doesn't really have a curveball. So he's about a three pitch guy and two of those pitches aren't very good. So today might be one of these days where we target some of the White Sox. They also don't hit for any power. They're super frustrating as well. But I think might be able to get to a little bit of Louie here. And sure enough, you actually got to lay a dollar thirty on them in the betting market. So uh, who'd have thought that the White Sox would be a a dollar thirty favorite in any baseball game this season? Eighty three WRC plus for them, twenty three percent carry. It's about average. Not walking a whole hell of a lot here, just six percent. Couple ticks below average, and not hitting for any power as I mentioned. Two ninety one wOBA with a one thirty six ISO is not great. So a lot of medium contact here. Nothing in the air really because they've got a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball in aggregate um that's going to play okay here against louis not so much the power righties you can still get to them but 120 ground ball to fly ball is still fine to attack um and certainly these early power suppression numbers from louis 366 woba to righties 306 iso this is a huge number there with a 2.8 homers per nine uh, pretty noisy, of course, in, in a short sample, but I think we can attack that, and a, a 120 ground ball to fly ball isn't too terribly worrisome um, and a, a horrible batted ball matchup. Now, if this were upwards of 180 or so, then we definitely don't want to be playing uh, ground ball hitters against a against a, a number like that, but I think this is an attackable number. And certainly with the lefties, we can go after ground ball or even fly ball hitters with an 080 ground ball to fly ball there because they, they're they still going to be able to give it, get it in the air and he'll give it up in the air a little bit. So, um, and not a terribly worrying split here, like with a Joe Ryan who has an 050 ground ball to fly ball or something against the left side, right? A little bit harder to attack there. Um, so short sample still here for Louie, but I think we might be able to get to a, a few of the White Sox. They do have Tim Anderson back. He's very playable 5,000. Benintendi is okay. He's 3,400 in the two-hole. That's a salary saver for you. You can play some Andrew Vaughn. He's at 28. And Eloy has been seeing the baseball a little bit better, of course. 3,100 for him. Luis Robert at 46, also playable. Gavin Sheets down at 2,300, probably the most pop from the left side. So you can play... Uh, a ground all behind the plate if you need it, or a, a burger with a lot of pop. He might be down at the bottom of the lineup, but um, I think the Sox are a little playable here. We might get to some short stacks with them, but also want to bang our head against a wall when they don't get there. Dylan Cease on the mound, 10-3. I, I really hate buying price spikes when a guy's been bad in his previous several starts. 
Um, there's variance with Cease. Like, we targeted Michael Kopech yesterday. He finally bounced a little bit, uh, which was encouraging to see. But he still walked a ton of guys. He still had, like, five walks. And we, we always run into this problem with Dylan Cease. He walks the whole country, elevates his own pitch count, and makes him very difficult to play a lot of the time. Now, his last two outings have been abbreviated, right? He got Tampa twice, back-to-back starts, and they beat him up, gave up three, gave up six runs. Now, the walks were a bit more in, under control, but it doesn't matter. You know, if you're pitching to this much contact, um, you, you know, it doesn't matter if you're putting people on base for free. If you're getting picked apart and, and giving up runs, like, who cares where they come from and how they got on base? Uh, but but the couple starts before that, five walks, five walks, two walks against these same twins earlier in the season. So uh, some variance, definitely, in, in the walk number here. He can't keep it down on occasion, and when that happens, he has the potential to pop really hard in the strikeout department. First outing this year, he got Houston for 10 Ks. Next outing against San Francisco, he got them for eight in five innings. So the K stuff is, is, isn't is necessarily a concern for Cease. It's the price tag, and it's the variance of throwing strike one and and walking people, putting them on base for free. So second time that the Twins have seen him this season, as I mentioned, he was serviceable, went five, struck out six in the first outing, just gave up the one run. Um, I think he's it's a playable price tag here. You're probably going to get a lot. This initial ownership number kind of makes me cringe a little bit. Uh, it's not that I'm worried about upside for Cease and or or anything like that, um, but there's variance here on this four seamer, and I I don't trust it really. Like he's got a really good slider, but a bad curveball and a bad change that he really didn't throw all that much. So he's mostly a a two and a half pitch guy, and the half isn't. I mean, I wouldn't even really give it a half, like two and a quarter pitch maybe. So um, if there's you know, lower spectrum variance on on this four seamer here. It makes it really difficult for him to pay off this type of price tag. So it's the price tag and the and, and the ownership here uh, that I'm a little concerned with it here in the early going, just on first blush. But um, it doesn't mean that the upside is not there. And it w- I mean, we saw Michael Kopech, who has been dreadful the entire season, really take apart the Twins for whatever it was, six or seven innings yesterday. So um, overall, some variance with the Twins for sure. I prefer to get to the, to them in full stacks because targeting a lot of ownership uh, on Dylan Cease when he's got this this walk variance in him, I really like doing that. Um, but don't get me wrong, going after a one of the highest upside arms on the day is not overly thrilling. So, um, you know, they're, they're well down the list, I think, are the Twins – in a preferred stack, but if you land on something there, uh, I don't think it's horrible. The price tags are probably what's going to keep you off. 55 for Buxton, 49 for Polanco, 47 for Correa. Um, you're not playing a guy like Joey Gallo, even though he's got the most pop in the world. Like He strikes out a 40% clip. No, thank you. So it's the guys in the middle of the lineup, like a Kepler, Trevor Larnick, um, Josie Miranda, that would help you get there price-wise. Uh, so overall, not too thrilling to be getting to offense um, in this game, mostly because the White Sox stink uh, and ceases on the mound. So I'd prefer to get to the Sox, if anything, and probably staying off of the Twins. But if you get to a twin stack here or there, or land on a, a Louis Varland at 6,000 against a, an underperforming lineup so far this season, I don't think either of those are the worst, but well down the list in, in favored plays. Okay, Toronto and the Red Sox. Man, I like this price on Alec Manoa. Um, 7200 uh, This is where we want to be. This makes it a really interesting decision. In his last couple of starts, he's been down here as well. 6800 against the Yankees, 69 against Seattle. And 72 against Boston. I mean, this is a pretty difficult matchup here. Boston's been fantastic against right-handers this year. 18, 19% K rate. Average walk rate at 8, 8%, but a 205 ISO at a 350 Woba with a 269 average. A lot of hard contact. They're getting the baseball in the air. 119 WRC plus. Very, very strong because they platoon so heavily. Verdugo, Yoshida, Devers, Duran, Tristan Casas, Manuel Valdez, and even Reese McGuire behind the plate. So um, 
they'll have Kike and probably Justin Turner in the list as, as the righties. And I, I think this is a playable stack once again for Boston. Um, I'm probably going to play them against most every righty in, in the league uh, outside of like Cole <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, they're very high upside. The prices are eh, just kind of marginal. Not super thrilled with 4,700 Verdugo at the top, but he's been fine. Uh, Yoshida at 4,800 is, is fine as well. He's not going to strike out at all. Devers at 59. Yeah, you can play that. You can pay that every day. It's uh, That's not a problem. Uh, Jaron Duran I really like at 3,500. Um, high upside prospect. Looks to be figuring it out finally after his uh, couple of short stints in the bigs last couple of years. I like that price a lot, 3500 You can get to a Tristan Casas at 26 He's got a ton of pop as well. Three true outcome type of guy um, against Manoa. Now, Manoa's not going to walk him, so he's going to pitch to some contact here, which is really like what we want to see. And against lefties, he has only a 19% strikeout rate. So that's kind of what takes me off of Manoa from a batted ball and fundamental perspective here. Um, north of 30% hard contact to the left side. 10% walk rate, 080 ground ball to fly ball, a little susceptible here with a 22% line drive rate. Anything over 20% we want to take note of there. And it's not that it's translating so much into power against Manoa for the lefties, but he can still give up a, a good bit of contact because the raw whiff stuff against the left side isn't all that impressive. He does have the the, the decent fastball mix here, of four-seamer, two-seamer, and that really allows him to run deep into counts. But overall, the arsenal isn't terribly impressive because the slider here that he's throwing a lot is basically a league average pitch. Changeup is, is pretty good, and that's because the four-seamer and the, the two-seamer are also pretty good. Just a seven-mile-an-hour velo delta here. I'd like to see this a little bit higher, the delta, and that would give him a bit more value um, against left-handers and give him a little bit more swing and miss. But uh, overall, he throws a sinker a lot, and that's not a swing and miss pitch to opposite-handed hitters. So um, fine fastball arsenal, and, and Alec Mano is a pitcher. He's not necessarily a DFS pitcher a lot of the time. This is a playable price tag for him, but the spot is pretty bad. So I'd, I'd probably side with Boston here and would probably like to get to some Boston stacks. Um I'm not sure I want to play Pavetta with them, however, at 7,500. Uh, Pavetta gives up too much hard contact for my liking. He really always has, and it's mostly been to the right side of the plate. Now, despite having a, a plus slider, uh, he throws a curveball way too much, and this is a hugely negative value pitch. I don't know why he's throwing it. I don't know why anybody's letting him throw it. This is awful. Throwing a full 25% of your arsenal as a breaking pitch uh, yielding one and a half outs below league average. It, like this is a, a a big big problem here. So he floats this curveball, turns into just kind of a, a spinning hanger, and it gets blasted by both sides of the plate. Gives up a lot of power. 208 ISO to the lefties, 161 to the righties. But the hard contact is really worrisome to the right side. 38 percent nearly. And with fly balls, so no thank you. This is why we're seeing, once again, a an elevated run total on Toronto. And I think they're a, a fine and playable stack. They are coming in top three in ownership, I believe, right now. Um, they'll probably hover there throughout the day as well. And so I like mostly offense here. I'm, I'm not intrigued with going after Pavetta, certainly against Toronto. They're not going to strike out a hell of a lot here. 21, 22% aggregate strikeout rate against righties. Buck 10 WRC plus, 160 ISO. Power hasn't quite shown up yet, but um, we know it's there. 34% hard contact, neutral ground ball to fly ball. So they're going to be able to get the ball on a line and in the air here against Pavetta. So I'm not dealing with this at 7,500. Um, the market pretty much agreeing, only coming in at about 3% right now. Very low median projection. <clears throat> Excuse me medium projection so far I'm not I'm not dealing with this he's got a high barrel rate he walks people and he gives up a lot of power so that's a pretty damn good recipe to be getting to some Toronto and I would like to get them get to them the only thing that's going to prevent us from getting there in spades is the pricing I mean this is a 27 28,000 dollar stack to get to all top five guys 
52 for Springer, that's fine. 6K for Bichette, he's been good and, and has earned that price tag, I think. Um, but really, it's been mostly like he's been mostly a tournament play. The consistency hasn't really been there, even though he's hitting 350 or, or whatever it is. Vladdy, 62. He also hasn't really exploded just yet. Matt Chapman, he's been the only really excellent piece and consistent piece for them so far. And he's at 5,800. So you, you got to pay for all these guys. Dalton Varsho's price finally came up 47 for him. So, after the dinger that he hit yesterday, maybe he's starting to see the baseball a little bit better. It's a, it's an upside spot for him, yeah. But you got to pay for these guys. So unfortunately, in order to get to a lot of Toronto stacks, you have to mix in some of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, like an Alejandro Kirk, 3,300. He's really not shown a lot of power uh, in the last year plus. The power hitting catcher for them is actually Danny Jansen. He's the fly baller that you most often want to get to. But Ali Kirk at 33, it's a very playable price tag. And you kind of have to mix in a lot of that. Same with like a Kiermaier down at the bottom of the list. Brandon Belt, unfortunately, he's only first base eligible, so he can't play both he and Vladdy. He's a 2,500, makes the other guys more palatable to get to. So unfortunately, you got to make some kind of gross decisions if you want to play a lot of Toronto. And that's what is probably going to keep their ownership in check a little bit, despite the very high upside fundamental spot here against Pavetta. So no pitching on the mound here for me. Uh, I do like the price tag at, at 72 on Manoa. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes six or even seven and suppresses Boston here, but this is a very dangerous spot for him without overwhelming whiff stuff to the left side of the plate. I'd much prefer to get to both offenses here. Uh, in Boston tonight. Still only about 50 degrees or so, but, you know, it's still a hitter's park. And, um, you know, we saw last night they put up, what, six or eight runs apiece. So no problems there. I'd much rather weather-wise get to this game, Baltimore and Kansas City. Kyle Gibson on the mound, 8,100. I think he's overpriced here, uh, even against the Royals. Now, I like, I can't, I very rarely play Kyle Gibson, and it's usually only on short slates when I do in very good matchups, and this is just an eight-gamer, but I'd consider short slates about five or, or fewer games. Um, this is a good matchup against the Royals. They have been awful against right-handed pitching, but we talked yesterday how they had a little bit of upside. We talked about Vladdy. We talked about Bobby Witt attacking a pretty low upside or low strikeout arm in Tyler Wells, and I think we can do the same thing today. Now, we got to keep an eye on... On Vladdy, he got hit on a backswing, I believe, last night. And he might be out um, nursing a, a finger or something like that. But he's still at 4,300. If he's in, you can you can play him for sure. You can still play Vinny. You can still play Bobby Witt. Their prices haven't changed. Uh, MJ got there last night. He's still at 4,000. Everybody on this team is still very cheap. So if you need to get to some expensive arms or another expensive secondary stack uh royals as a primary can make that happen for you and i mean this is probably outside of coors field the best raw hitting environment in terms of weather uh it's still a, a large ballpark but um both of these arms on the mound zach grinky on the other side and kyle gibson going for the o's I, they're very attackable it's not that there should be a lot of contact here um Granke himself pitching to 84% contact, Gibson at 77%. So really when we want to attack the Royals, it's with high upside strikeout arms. Uh, Kyle Gibson is not that. This is a suppression spot, definitely, and he could pop there for, I don't know, 20 points or so at 8,100. But overall, very low upside for Kyle Gibson. He throws about six pitches, and none of them are really any good. I think I say this every start for, for Gibson. Um Throwing a lot of fastballs, all basically league average and slightly plus. Uh, bad changeup, marginal slider, bad curveball. So really not all that excited. It is six pitches, however, and that does allow him to survive. But if we want to attack, um, I mean, we can get to him with both sides. It doesn't really matter here. Hard contact is there against righties that we'd like to attack. 157 ISO is there as well. 316 WOBA. In terms of raw power and and base runners, 272 average to the left side, 350 Woba with a 181 ISO, just a 17% K rate, 25% hard contact leaves a little bit on the table for us in terms of 
targeting an offense against him, but um, still very attackable and going to pitch to a lot of contact. So I think this is a fine spot to get to some of the Royals. Wouldn't be surprised if they shit to bed because they're the Royals, but um, I think it's perfectly fine to get to them. It is 70 plus degrees over in KC, and the ballpark plays up power a little bit when it's warm there. So um, on the other side, Grinky, we're not playing him, 56. And he got beat up a little bit in his last start, and Grinky is a he he's a he's a pitcher, and despite giving up seven runs, this doesn't happen to him very often. He'll get tagged for three pretty much every outing, but he survives. They still let him go about five. It's not that you could play him in DFS, but it makes him frustrating to stack against sometimes. Now, this is Baltimore. I'd much rather still get to them. This is probably the second best team in baseball, to be quite honest. Um, at least here in the early going. And, I mean, in terms of record, definitely them in Tampa, I believe. I'd much rather get to the O's still and, and target Granky, even though I don't like going after. I generally don't like stacking against Granky. I did it with Minnesota, um, and we kind of luck boxed our way there a little bit. But I don't know. I, I'm still probably going to do it with Baltimore, but I would not be surprised if Granky bounces here a little bit and and he goes five five and a third or whatever it is as Granky is pretty much want to do uh, at this point in his career and and just survive, give up two to three runs or something and strike out one <laughs> and throw 84 pitches or, or whatever it is. Uh, just kind of a typical Zach Rinky outing anymore. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, that said, I also wouldn't be surprised because of the potency of this lineup over here for Baltimore for them to really get to him um, and, and take him apart in back-to-back -back starts. So uh, I think this is fine. He hasn't seen them yet this year and... It, this could be a little difficult uh, of a an outing for some of these younger hitters over here. Granky can still win this matchup. He's not going to overpower them, of course, with velocity. Uh, he's going to overpower them with sequencing and location, and that's really how Granky wins games uh, and keeps it, it keeps runs off the board. But that said, um, every one of the ball, let me Baltimore is still a a pretty high upside stack here, uh, even if Granky only gives up a couple. The Royals bullpen is terrible, so and and they have to throw uh, a lot of innings, pretty much every night, um, since their starting pitching has been bad too. So you can get to everybody here. Fa favorite price adjusted place probably going to be Gunner here in the middle of the lineup, 4100. I like this spot for him to kind of get going a little bit. You can play some Adam Frazier. He's at 25. You're going to have to, similar to Toronto, make some decisions down at the bottom of the lineup to get to some cheaper pieces in order to fit in a Cedric Rutch and a Ryan Mountcastle, who had two bombs yesterday. Santander makes it palatable. He's at 4,400. It's a good spot for him, too. So uh, I, I like getting to the O's here. Uh, not that I'm going to play Granky, but i probably temper my ownership um, on, on the Orioles. If they start to steam a little bit, I'm not interested really. I mean, I'm less interested. Uh, and if they if they come in under own, I'm, I'm probably okay with, with playing some of that. Okay, Angels and the cards. Shohei on the mound, 11-4 for him. Um, this is fine. It's just a price tag and lineup construction sort of thing. Now, he's coming in at just about 20% right now. Uh, this is a tough spot, admittedly, for uh, for Shohei. Uh, this is Shohei. He's, he's got 33% K rate. We're not really worried about that. He's throwing strikes. He did get picked apart a little bit in his last outing, I believe. Um, checking over here on the... Yeah, it wasn't his last out. He gave up five earned uh, against Oakland. Really just did not have it. Struck out eight still, but, um, you know, gave up five earned. Went six innings, which is nice. Um, nothing worrisome, of course, for, for Shohei on the mound. He got a day off yesterday, so hopefully uh, he's going to be ready to go. Um, and, and this is a fine spot. If you can make 11-4 work, then by all means. It's much easier to make 11-4 work today than it was... I mean, obviously we had the cheap guys on the mound, so we could get to Cole and we could get to Gallon, no problem. It's easier to make an 11-4 work on a shorter slate when there are just fewer elite arms. And, of course, Shohei is an elite arm. Uh, median projection so far coming in a little bit lower, and that's really just because of the strikeout rates and this and the suppression that that we usually yield when attacking the Cardinals. 21% K rate, 9% walk rate. 
Not a lot of power coming from them just yet, but still some hard contact, and they're a sticky lineup. A lot of good veteran hitters over here, or a couple at least. Um, Goldschmidt, Arenado, Wilson Contreras, and some good young hitters with a lot of upside. Lars, uh, he'll be at the top of the lineup most likely. 4,500, I'm not jacked about playing him, to be honest. Nolan Gorman, young hitter there, 4,600, not playing that. Uh, in most scenarios, Paul Goldschmidt, 57, really not excited about that. Um, 47 for Arenado's fine in general, but this is Shohei. It's not like a super high upside spot for Arenado. And Wilson Contreras behind the plate, 44. I mean, not really excited about stacking St. Louis, of course. I mean, they're going to come in with a very low top stack probability for you. But, um, you know, if you want to stack against or, or take a couple of one-off pieces against Shohei and just get a little bit of leverage, it's not horrific. Um it, I mean, it's it's not great, though. <laughs> so I'm really not thrilled about targeting any uh, any Cardinals here. Despite the low strikeout rates in general, the pricing really keeps me off. Um, I would prefer to, if I were going to play anybody, it would be like an Alec Burleson. Uh, 3300 I think that's a playable price tag. There's upside at that price for him. Um, but overall, like Shohei's throwing 24 pitches here, and I, I'm, not, I'm just not dealing with this. So um, everything's good. It, it's all fine. Slider's good. Splitter's good. Four-seamer and a cutter are, are serviceable enough that um, that he can pick through the Cardinals still. And like I said, he, he got a day off yesterday, and he was not good in his last start. Um, overall, Shohei is very good, so we can't expect uh, poor performances like that against poor teams to really persist. And he can go after a good team and, and pick through them, uh, no problem. So it's fine if you can make it happen at 11-4. 61 for Michaelis on the mound. Uh, I'm probably not going to be doing this. It, like I'm intrigued with the price tag for sure. Um, in his previous, like the problem with Michaelis is that the the strikeout stuff just isn't that impressive. Just a 19% aggregate K rate for him as well. We usually want to go after the Angels with high strikeout right-handers if we're going to go after them, and because they strike out a 23.5% clip here, 101 WRC plus, very underwhelming so far for the what should be uh, a very high upside lineup against both sides 165 iso the hitting for a little bit of power mostly coming from trout and otani i guess and hunter renfro too but the other guys neto rendon brandon drury he's been excellent so this is definitely raising the iso over the last couple of weeks but that's been mostly against lefties um everybody else kind of really been uh underwhelming certainly taylor war they've had to drop him down to the seven hole he finally got there yesterday he's at another playable price at four thousand today uh ren Hifo's down here cheap it'll make getting to a uh, trout and a hunter renfro at 63 and 5100 respectively uh, a little bit easier ren Hifo at 31 you can play matt thice behind the plate it's fine if you want to go after a low k arm here um iso numbers starting to creep up for michaelis a little bit 150 and north of that with a low strikeout rate is an attackable number. Still induces a decent bit of soft contact, 17 and 18 percent to both sides. So something to be aware of there. Control has always been good with Michaelis. Doesn't walk people. It's just the raw strikeouts and the high contact rate that we're really concerned with. So I think we can get to some angels once again here. I do like the price tag, of course. Uh, when we're down here at this range for Michaelis, uh, I think he can. Like, he has upside for 20 and 22 points here. Uh, we saw him in, in his last out, it goes six and a third strikeout six against the Giants. So he was 5,600. Down here at these price levels, there's upside for Michaelis. Um, probably not super thrilled about going after the Angels here. I'd, I'd probably side with them because I'm not in, encouraged by the high, super high contact rate for Michaelis in general. And... I'd like to get to full angel stacks because when Michaelis is bad, he floats this sinker, can't spot the four seamer, and the slider's just a barginal pitch for him as it is anyway. Doesn't have a change up to the left side, so he can get beat up really, really good by some lefties. Uh, they will have Otani back in the lineup. Unfortunately, you can't pl play him as a hitter. So you'd have to get to a Renhifo and a Matt Theis to really balance out your, your other high upside power righties like Trout and Renfro. Taylor Ward, whoever else they got on the lineup. So um, I would like to get to some Angels. Not super thrilled about um, about full stacks here. It's just kind of underwhelming because they're not a very good offense, to be quite honest. But uh, 
I don't know. I, I think playing both the Angels and if you land on a little bit of Michael at 6,100, I think this is probably okay today. Okay, Milwaukee and Colorado. Let's get through Coors Field here. We're not playing Eric Lauer at 8,900. He just gives up homers in bunches. Um, he has a still a raw 4% homer rate. This is one of the higher numbers in baseball. It's about double what you would like it to be. Um, it, and we're just not doing it at Coors Field. It throws a curveball at a full 16% of the time. We saw yesterday that one of the few guys that did get to Freddy Peralta was Elias Diaz, and it was on a hanging curveball. So um, you cannot throw this pitch at Coors Field. I don't, I don't care who you are. Um, it, it's sliders. It, it's cutters. It's four-seamers. You have to stay down in the strike zone. Change-up's fine, but if you you better keep this down. Um, and Eric Lauer really does not. He is... You know, two lefties, sure, he's a ground ball pitcher, but to right, he's a heavy fly ball pitcher. 064, 065 ground ball to fly ball with a 37% hard contact rate and 1.7 homers per nine. A 201 ISO. No thank you. Not doing this at Coors Field with Eric Lauer and an elevated price tag. I don't know, I mean, what we're doing uh, with that. So staying away from that, give me some of the Rockies, even though they're they're a little bit expensive. They're going to come in at half of the ownership, as I mentioned in the outset to the Brewers. So give me some Colorado. I think there's, there's a high upside spot for them. And really for a couple of their guys, they're not known for uh, a lot of home run power. But, of course, jury's going to hit from both sides. Still 3,800 and still too cheap at Coors Field. Um, if he starts heating up a little bit, he's a very streaky hitter. You can play that, certainly. And it doesn't really matter if he's heating up or not. He's 3,800 in the two-hole at Coors Field. So go ahead. Uh Chris Bryant, 59, got to pay for him, but he's been fantastic. The power has kind of dropped off a little bit, um, but still hitting for very high average, right? Still hitting, hovering about 300 or give or take. And 59, I'm not super thrilled with, but uh, you can play this. And CJ Crone, 51, I like this spot a lot for him. Um, Eric Lauer does have some K stuff to the right side, 24%, but we mentioned the hard contact and the fly balls to CJ Crone. I think this is a pretty or two righties rather for cj crone i think is a pretty high upside spot at this price tag elias diaz you can play him again 4500 still has plenty of pop kind of a you know a very high variance um catcher play is diaz behind the plate but he's got plenty of power and he had a ball up onto the concourse at coors field last night it, it was a bomb also a kind of a, a spinning slider I, I believe it was um in any case there's plenty of right-handed power here in the lineup. Uh, Zeke Tovar hit, hit a ball to the deepest ball, deepest part of Coors Field last night. He's at 3,000. You could play him. Alan Treo might be in the list as well, 3,600. Now, their prices have come up since the earlier season, you know, flat 2,000 prices. But you could play every one of these guys. They have Grichik back in the lineup. Um, over the last couple of seasons, he's been trying to lift the ball a little bit more. Um, and and really focus on on getting the baseball in the air at Coors Field. Thirty nine hundred, very playable price tag for him. You can play some of these lefties as well. So not overly worried about playing the Rockies, even though they're a bad team that struck out fourteen times last night or whatever last night. Um, you can still play them against a guy that gives up a lot of power. Kyle Freeland, you're not playing him. Sixty two hundred. Uh, this it could be a suppression spot for him. Because Milwaukee's been awful against left-handers literally all season, and we're really not seeing the numbers change. I mean, they've only had a couple, whatever they get, one or two outings a week against a lefty. So it's going to take a while for these numbers to fully converge here. But 31% K rate is still pretty awful. 72 WRC+, plus, not really coming up uh, all that aggressively. Now, when when it does come up, it's going to come up very quickly. Um but at least the WRC plus the strikeout numbers are going to come down and that could very well be here against Kyle Freeland, who has a 17% aggregate K rate himself. Like I said, it could be a suppression spot for Kyle as he throws a full five and six pitches here, but like none of them are really any good. Um, fine fastball mix that he could survive with, but the changeup is really bad. And that's why he gives up a 175 ISO to the right side, 37% hard contact. And, even though Kyle suppresses production 
sometimes, and he'll go six innings or, or whatever it is. Uh, the hard contact is a, a bomb waiting to explode, certainly at Coors Field. He gives up a 200 ISO to lefties as well. So um, not interested in playing Kyle, even at 6,200 against what's been a really bad lineup. If you want to take deep tournament shots on a 6,200 guy, I'd rather play Michaelis, to be honest. But, um, you know, Kyle Freeland is not the worst. He could survive for five innings. You're probably only going to get 15, 18 points out of him as a ceiling in most scenarios here. So at, in tournaments, I'm not all that thrilled about uh, going after this. Just give me the Brewers again. At least their prices at the top of the lineup uh, are starting to come up. Yelich 56, Adama 61, Contreras 48. Uh, but the other righties are still very cheap and very playable. So you can make Brewer stacks happen, no problem. And that's what's going to keep their ownership high. So you got to balance that. Uh, it's a it's a fine spot, of course, because uh, Freeland here pitching to 81% contact rate um, and hard contact. So uh, you can get to every one of them. I like Owen Miller, like Luke Voigt, Brian Anderson, definitely. Uh, Mikey Brousseau is going to pop for you pretty hard, I assume, at 3500 Finally, his price is coming up, but it's still short of where it should be at Coors Field. Um, 36 for Voigt, Owen Miller at 3K flat. Tyrone Taylor, they activated last night. He's at 2,400. High upside righty here has always hit lefties pretty decently. Joey Weimer has a, a lot of pop down at the bottom of the lineup. So they can go very right-handed heavy here. So I'm not going near Kyle Freeland. If I land on a 62, I'd probably exit and, and get to Michaelis instead. So give me the Brewers here for sure. And give me the Rockies definitely if they're coming in at half the ownership of Milwaukee. Okay. Last game of the day here, Logan Gilbert on the mound against Oakland. Uh, man, good pitching last matchup last night uh, for Bryce Miller and Mason Miller. The, both these guys were just excellent. Um, really excited to continue to watch those two pitch. Uh, certainly very high upside arms for both of them. J.P. Sears on the mound for Oakland, not a very high upside arm, at least for DFS purposes. Logan Gilbert, yeah, sometimes. Um, he's got some issues, a little bit to the right side, right? 274 average, 332 woven, a 177 ice out of the righties. Just a 20% K rate here, even though he throws gas. Um, the slider's really not all that great. Curveball's okay, but it's kind of... It, it, it's a straight four seamer, right? He throws hard, and everybody can really hit 96 at this level. So uh, when it's straight and it doesn't doesn't move, he tails this back over the middle of the plate a little bit, and it leads to a 36% hard contact rate to the right side. So he's susceptible a little bit to getting on the barrel to the righties in aggregate, not a high barrel rate, because he's actually pretty elite against lefties. Good change up here, good curveball, throwing a split change a little, just kind of a show-me pitch here. Mostly four-seamer slider curveball, uh, and and the straight change at uh, at a full seven ten percent of the arsenal um, makes him really good against lefties. Two hundred six average, two fifty seven wOBA with a buck ten ISO, twenty eight percent K rate. So we want lefty heavy lineups when we're playing a lot of Logan Gilbert on the mound. He's coming in as the chalkiest piece right now, just because this is Oakland and they're bad. Uh, 26% aggregate K rate for them so far this year against righties, 87 WRC plus, 132 ISO with a 289 WOBA. No hard contact, popping up a lot of balls, hitting them in the air uh, against right-handers so far. A lot of soft contact. So um, real, like, very low upside here for Oakland. Even though they've got some lefties down here, Ryan Noda, Jace Peterson, um, you know, those are really the, the only guys with pop. Connor Capel, Tony Kemp, not so much. Estieri Ruiz, he's been excellent for them at the top of the lineup, but he still plays for Oakland. Ramon Laureano's back healthy. Uh, he's a mainstay in the in the middle of the lineup at 39. Brent Rooker has shown the most power for them at 38. So if you want to get to a couple of the righties, give me some Estieri Ruiz, or Brent Rooker, Ramon Laureano. You can play Shea, of course. He's got plenty of pop, 3600 That's a playable price, definitely. And at an elevated ownership number here for Logan Gilbert so far, pushing 40%, I think he could take some um, some short Oakland stacks against him. I probably would stay off of most of the lefties outside of a Jace Peterson maybe. Uh, I mean, you could mix in a Ryan Noda. He's 2,300, but you got to play him at first base. Uh, Jace, you got to play him at third. A little more palatable there, but he's also 2,500. Plenty of pop. So if you are going to mix in a full five-man stack, I'd probably go three righties with maybe even four righties with one lefty, uh, but you could mix in 
pretty much any combination of the top six guys. Um, and Connor Capel and Tony Kemp, Kevin Smith down at the bottom of the lineup, they'll make it cheap for you if you need to get that cheap. Uh, pretty low upside stack, as, as we talked about, though. Um, so keep that in mind. And there might be some rain we have to deal with here in Oakland. Kind of, I mean, nothing terrible. It's not like the game's getting rained out or, or anything like that. So uh, nothing serious to worry about, but uh, just something to keep in my, keep an eye on and keep in mind if we are getting heavy exposures to Logan Gilbert. I like the price tag here, of course, and we'll see what the what the A's want to do. They play the platoon shenanigans, and the, you can be damn sure that they're aware, well aware of these numbers. So they may go a little right-handed heavy tonight, which would probably make me come in under the field on Gilbert. Uh, I, I love this arm. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and I love attacking Oakland. They are bad. So I, I think it's fine to come in with a, a some pretty hefty ownership. Should he be in four of our every 10 teams that we build tonight? Yeah, probably. Um, and it's, it's really the price tag that's going to make us get there. So we can we, we got to be careful of the ownership. See if this steams throughout the day. It might. And if it if it gets too out of out of control, um, that obviously drops my enthusiasm pretty significantly about coming in with leverage on him and getting over the field. But uh, I think it's a perfectly fine fundamental spot. We can attack Oakland pretty much with anybody. JP Sears on the mound. We're not going to be doing this. 5,700. He pitches to way too much contact. 19, 20% K rate in aggregate for him. 15% to lefties, 21% to righties, whatever. 81% raw contact rate. 080 round ball to fly ball. No, thank you. 10.5% barrel rate. No, thank you. Um, we're not going after J.P. Sears here. I mean, we're going to go after him with Seattle, definitely. Julio was back last night. I believe he DH'd. Um, maybe not. I could be making that up. But uh, Ty France down to 4,100. Yeah, give me give me a lot of this. Uh, I like this now. Uh, Gino Suarez, 37. You could play him even though he's just like, bleh. Uh, Tay Oscar at 4,000, definitely. A.J. Pollock hit a bomb at 31 last night. Um, you could play him for sure. Jared Kemlick, you can play him pretty much against against both sides. And if you want to go after him and throw him in stacks here, very low strikeout rate and whiff stuff for JP Sears against lefties. It's short sample, and he's suppressed power to the left side, inducing some soft contact. So it's not my favorite to go after a Kelnick at 44, but if you land on him in some stacks, I think that's fine. Um, Jose Caballero down at the bottom of the lineup, high upside prospect for them that they recently called up. They're giving some run in the middle infield because Sam Haggerty stinks. Uh, 2000 flat for him. He'll make it cheaper to get to a Julio, but the other guys in the, in the rest of the lineup, they're very play, very playable at those price tags. 57 for Julio. You always got to pay for that, but like whatever. Um, so give me some Seattle here targeting JP Sears and you can correlate with uh, Logan Gilbert, Logan Gilbert. You're going to see some kind of medium ish ownership on Seattle. And I like that spot a lot. So give me, um, Maybe a couple A's against against Gilbert, just as like you know hedge pieces or whatever against my very likely heavy ownership on him. Um, but mostly Gilbert, of course, and the Mariners. Okay, so that'll do it for the breakdown. Um, probably about an hour once again. Sorry about that. But uh, let's go over stacks real quick. Um, Cleveland. Okay, give me some lefties here against Clark Schmidt. He gives up way too much power to the left side. Give me some Beaver too. Cubs and Washington, mostly just the Cubs here. I don't want anything to do with Washington against Stroman, even though they don't strike out. I like Stroman a little bit here. He's playable price at 91. And definitely give me the Cubs against uh, Jake Irvin making his major league debut. No whiff stuff here. Uh, Minnesota and the White Sox. Give me some of the Sox, I think, against Louis Varland. If you land on a 6K Louis Varland, probably rather get to a Miles Michaelis at 61, but um, I think it's okay to... to play both sides there would would side with um, the White Sox definitely give me some cease I don't like the walks I don't like the price tag uh, against Minnesota I think it's a high variant spot for him to be honest um yeah it's I'm lukewarm I'm not sure where I'm gonna land on Dylan cease just yet Toronto and Boston give me offense pretty much only in this game I, I like the price tag on Manoa I do not like the price tag on Pavetta and I don't like the fundamentals on Pavetta either so give me Toronto and give me Boston Baltimore and Kansas City yeah I'm going back to this game uh, we're going to play Baltimore again. Probably going to bang our head against the wall when Granky goes five innings, gives up two runs. 
Uh, and give me some Kansas City. I think you tar- target Kyle Gibson as well with plenty of, of opportunity over here at attainable price tags for KC. Angels in St. Louis. Give me some of the Angels, but I wouldn't be surprised. Michaelis Pops at 6,100. Not interested in, in St. Louis. Just give me Shohei, of course. Uh, Milwaukee, yeah, you just got to balance the ownership here. But give me the, some of the Rockies. I, I, I'll try to force in some stacks here of the Rockies. Eric Lauer just gives up too much power. Uh, Seattle and Oakland Mariners definitely. I think they're going to be kind of an off the board stack, um, and you can correlate them with uh, Logan Gilbert. Maybe some A's pieces just to come off a little bit of the the Gilbert ownership. But um, that's it for the breakdown. Once again, keep an eye on changes throughout the day. These numbers will change, and we'll be pushing them as often as possible. So good luck, everybody.